Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Stephen Cangiano. I am the president and co-founder of RDNT Media and Events with its online companions, relationship-development.com and humanity-upgrade.com. It is a sincere pleasure to bring an old friend to RDNT TV. This gentleman is not only He's multidimensional. He's a, a world-renowned health expert, a thought leader, and he's also got excellent experience in business. Let me give you a little bit of background. Since 1967, that's hard to believe, Bill, California, uh, Bill's a Californian. Bill Tara has been an active advocate for natural health. He was the vice president of Erwan Trading Company, one of America's first national distributors of organic foods, way ahead of his time, and was co-founder of Sunwheel Natural Foods in London, England. He has been a health counselor, teacher, author, entrepreneur, and creator of health education centers in Europe and North America. His innovative and creative teaching of traditional approaches to health, healing, and personal development has taken him to over 20 countries as, uh, as a seminar leader. He has appeared on a variety of radio and television shows in England, America, and Australia, speaking on dietary policy and the environment, including Nightline with Ted Koppel. In 1975, he founded the Community Health Foundation in London, England, a charitable, charitable trust that was the largest natural health education center in the world bill there's a lot more things i can mention um we we, we want to have time for uh, for a discussion <laughs> can you can you can, anything i should add to that anything you want people sounded to know like the history channel. <laughs> pardon me <laughs> sounded like something from the history channel <laughs> no well, that's you, that, sounds, that sounds it up geez you but you 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 haven't got uh, ted koppel in there <laughs> That was a long time ago. <laughs> well, you know, you have a, a great – and and just as by way of background, you and I worked in the health and wellness business together. That's right. And, yeah, I, you had a, a meteoric rise, tremendous success in that business. Uh, so I have, I have respect for you not only as a health advocate, as a scientist, but also as an entrepreneur. You've really had, a, had a, some great careers. So, all right, so let, let's get into – so now – um, tell us your background. In other words, you have been a world-renowned teacher in the health advocacy um, market. G give give our viewers some some understanding and reality about that. Well, Stephen, I ca I came into this backwards, you know. And you mentioned the word scientist, and I'm not a scientist. I'm I'm a, I'm a public advocate. I, uh, I got in for the same reasons uh, that many people do, and that is I had a personal experience. Uh, I was 24. I was uh, very happy with the business that I was in, with my career. Uh, but I had a very bad case of ulcers, uh, uh, duodenal ulcers, and I was told that I was going to have to have surgery. And it just so happened that at the same time, a roommate of mine started, started following a macrobiotic diet, you know, and came home with this book and said he was going to cure his asthma by eating twigs and bark. And so I thought that was amusing. And so I, I decided to try to give it a try along with him. And what I noticed was that very quickly, um, uh, the symptoms all went away. I felt better than I had in years and years. And I thought, wow, that's really fascinating. And so I, I was very naive. I, next time I went back to my doctor, I, um, uh, I wrote out the whole program that I had, which was the exact opposite of the diet that she had given me. I'm not kidding, but mm -hmm. point by point, it was the exact opposite. I went in and I showed that to her after, after I had had tests uh, done. And she said, well, it was fantastic. The, uh, you know, the ulcers seemed to be healing up incredibly. Um, the medication is working. And I said, I haven't taken the medication in a long, long time. I said, and I'm not following the diet. Here's what I'm doing. And she freaked out on me. She absolutely went crazy. She said I was no longer her patient if I was going to do this voodoo approach to healing. And, uh, and God bless her, because when I walked out of there, 
uh, I had always thought, well, I'll keep eating this way, but I'll just go back to doing what I'm doing. But her response was shocking to me. I thought, why would somebody who's a scientist not be interested in objective information generated out of her own x-rays and her own blood tests and everything? Why would she have that kind of response? And, and also, how come using something that was thousands of years old worked when modern medicine didn't? And I thought, well, I better study this a little bit or I'm going to get interested. And that was the end of it. It was all uphill from there. <laughs> wow, that's beautiful. So that's a great story. And fortunately, it happened to you when you were young. Yeah. Uh, and, and fortunately, you didn't go down that often jaded path of traditional medicine. Now, traditional medicine is great for a lot of things, but for those chronic situations, it's not. Tell us... Um, so you, you, live, you live in Europe, but you also do a lot of work here in the States. In your opinion, on average, in general, do Americans have a healthy diet? No. I mean, we actually, actually the, the diet that's pretty much uh, uh, killing the world is generated out of the American food industry. You know, uh, in, 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 in fact, now all of, the, all of the research shows, and I'm talking about the World Health Organization and really reliable information sources, shows that when the American diet moves into another country, that's when the rates of diabetes go up, the rates of heart disease go up, but, you know, give it a few years and the cancer rates start to grow up. So this is a, a really terrible situation. And um, I can only hope that out of that in America comes uh, some sort of a, a solution to the problem because we have the most experience with it. We know, I mean, I was of the first generation, and you probably were too, uh, where fast foods were really starting to become available. I can remember the first drive-in restaurant, you know, and my family was like, whoa, a drive we drove in, and the girls on roller skates around bringing the hamburgers and the milkshakes. I mean, it was nuts, you know, but it was, it was uh, unique, and, uh, the, and the food was tasty, uh, and so it just went like wildfire there, you know, and it and so many things changed after World War II. In the 19, 1950s, uh, the American food industry just went nuts. You know, they started putting more and more additives in. The, the, the whole position of a food flavorist came, be, became an issue, and artificial foods started becoming more and more commonplace. Uh, supermarkets started growing, some more frozen foods available. And uh, part of that, of course, has a, has a plus side that many people will see, and that was that there, there was less expensive food available for more people. But the impact of that on, on, on America as a whole was catastrophic. And one of the reasons was that it completely destroyed the regional growth of food. You know, if, when you could freeze something and ship it to the other coast, all of a sudden uh, areas like in New York used to, used to have a huge apple industry. Uh, but if there's someplace else that can grow apples cheaper, then the apple industry in New York goes out of business. Right. You know, uh, and, and, and so you get this strange thing, and now that's happened all over the world. I mean, there's places in the world. Uh, I do a bit of teaching in Spain, and there's, um, there's an area in southern Spain uh, uh, between Malaga and, and, uh, and, and Gibraltar that's got the biggest greenhouses in the world. And these greenhouses pretty much grow all the vegetables for northern Europe. I mean, particularly all the salad vegetables. Uh, you know, and they're, and they're completely operated by uh, migrant workers that come from Africa. You know, so there's, so the, the food industry in Spain has been completely wiped out because of this new way, this new approach to making cheap food. And, and all of that is combined with uh, trying to get this new diet, which is an industrial age diet. It's a new industrial diet. It's a, the McDonald's, it's the fast foods, it's the frozen foods. And it's led us in the wrong direction, you know, and now we're starting to see the results of it. Yeah, so, so obviously definitely seeing the results because you and I are both in the health industry. And the reason I call you a scientist is because, and, and I know you're being modest, you know this industry. I've read your stuff. You are brilliant in this, in this, in this industry and what, what you do. Let's unpack what you said. First, you talked about the fast food industry protein, animal protein rich, fat laden, salt laden, preservative laden, dairy laden. And then we kind of kind of migrated into that the food isn't natural and all the like 
for instance, I live in right New York State, right? Northern New Jersey, almost New York State. And you're absolutely correct. The Apple industry here thrived for centuries, and I mean, for decades at least, and that's changed. So, um, what, what, t tell, us, tell us the impact of this processed foods, and then I want to get into some of the ma uh, macro vegan stuff where you talk about locally raised uh, food and, and the benefits of that. It's very difficult, Stephen, to, um, uh, for me anyway, uh, to isolate these problems out. And the, and the reason is that they're, they're interlaced with each other. Um, a lot of the decisions that we make in the food industry that are, are, that are made in the food industry um, have huge environmental impacts. And those environmental impacts then wash back into the quality of the food that we eat. And so the... the, the the result of that uh, is huge consumer confusion. People get very confused. I mean, what's, you know, for the last three years, four years, uh, if you read most health magazines, you would think if you weren't using coconut oil, you were going to be dead next week. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it did everything, you know, it was good for everything. Uh, and, and now a new report comes out from Harvard University telling people that it's probably the worst oil you can use in your food. And people are saying, geez, you know, what, what's, the tr what's the truth here? Well, the truth is, when we are eating in, within our ecological biome, within our ec ecological niche, the place where we live, when we're eating as close as possible to that, our, our body becomes more in harmony with the environment that we live in. Even when we're separated out from that environment, even when we're living in an air-conditioned house, even when we're eating, living in a, in a house that's cooled during, uh, or warmed during the winter, your body knows what the temperature is. Your body knows where the sun is. And so the body is always trying to make homeostasis, which you and I both know really means being able to balance with your environment. It doesn't just have to do with blood quality. It has to do with making balance with your environment. And the environment is always there, you know. So one of the one of the principles of Oriental medicine is being in balance with the environment that you live in through eating for the seasons and things like that, which I think Marlene talked with you about. Those are very important concepts, but those are things that people see as abstractions, but they're not abstractions. They're not abstractions because they impact us environmentally, economically, right across the board. And so if we're going to be, if we're going to live a healthy diet and people are going to advise on creating a nutritional pattern, which really is going to produce health, we have to start looking at the environmental impact of all of the foods that we eat. And we have to go back. And what we find is something that uh, I almost hate to use the word, but it's, it's the right word. And that is karma. When you, when you do something in the environment, which harms the environment, it ends up harming you. This is one of the principles of ecology, you know, uh, uh, Barry Commoner in the 1970s, the father of the environmental movement, uh, said that there's no free lunch in nature. You know, whatever you do is going to come back on you and everything is connected within that. And we see this dramatically uh, displayed in a way that everybody can understand when it comes down to uh, taking information about health and sickness. Uh, and then you have, the, the, the industries that produce those foods lobbying so heavily against them. I mean, we've known that, we've known that, uh, that animal fats contribute to cancer uh, for mm, since the 1970s. Many people were saying that a long time before that. But since the 1970s, there's been significant research that's there. And that research keeps getting presented over and over and over again. And every time they do, politically, when it comes up to a, for a political vote on what the food pyramid looks like, right, the meat and dairy industry come in and say, you know, if you say that word, you're never going to get elected again. And right. that's where it stops. Yeah. yeah. And, that, yeah. and so, and so he, here's the thing, Bill, it's like we, we, you and I could sit here and talk for 10 hours. It is it, the wealth of information that you have that people need to hear to me, what's, what's really amazing is how human beings can hold two conflicting ideas at one time. They, 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 they have an animal diet, an animal fat diet, yet they love their pets. 
they they're really they're really against global warming and all these environmental changes but it's difficult it seems like it's difficult for them to make the connection well you, you know where i'm going here why is it difficult for people to make the connection because before we got off before we started the interview we talked about the environmental impact of the animal uh, food industry. Why don't you, what, let's connect that with what we're discussing here. And, and well, the, the phenomenon that you're talking about has, has a name in psychology. It's called cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance happens when you try to keep two ideas of same value in your mind. And it doesn't work. It makes you crazy. And you end up having to choose one. And the one that you choose is usually the one that you're most familiar with. And uh, I grew up in the American school system, so did you probably. Uh, in that school system, we all found out that uh, if you want to have protein, if you want to have muscle, you eat meat. Muscle creates muscle. If you want to have strong bones, uh, you drink cow's milk because look at baby calves. They have strong bones. Right. You know? I mean, it was this really simplistic approach. But what's been, what we've discovered is that that was just totally erroneous. Totally erroneous. Um, you almost could consider it to be an evil plot, you know, if you were looking at it from that point of view, because it was just so, so wrong. And when you do something, again, that's so, so wrong, what happens is the repercussions of that in life start to hurt. Now, the, the animal industry, um, and, 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 and as you brought up there, uh, that's the biggest polluter in the world. That's the biggest contributor to greenhouse gas in the world, is animal farming. I mean, we kill billions and billions of animals every year. And uh, let, me, let me just stop you there for one sec, because I think we want that to land on people, because people don't believe that. Most people think it's the heavy industrial industry. Most people think it's the energy, like electricity generation and that can power generation. But what you're saying is that the animal food industry is the biggest greenhouse gas polluter in the world. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and j just give them some facts and figures on that because that was, when I was reading through your stuff, that was the one thing I said, really? Is that possible? I had to actually confirm with you. Go, go through that with some people. With the people. Well, there's a, there's a number of things about that, Stephen. One is that um, in, in terms of pollution in general, uh, it wins hands down because all of the excrement from cattle, uh, all, of the, all of the urine, all of the feces, everything, that gets washed out into rivers, and, and that starts to pollute the rivers, which in turn pollute the ocean. So you have places like the Gulf of Mexico, which is basically a dead zone. That means that there's, there, there's, so much, uh, there's so much plankton in the water that it eats up all the oxygen and fish can't live there. So you just have, you just have a, a desert under the ocean. So that's one effect. The other effect is uh, the, em the emissions from, not only from the cattle, everybody jokes about the emissions from the cattle, you know, the nitrogen in cow farts, right? But that's a, that's a very real thing. That's methane gas going right out. But even more so than that, and that is that in order to feed those cattle, you have to destroy thousands and thousands of acres of forest to grow soybeans and corn to feed those animals. And that is where one of the biggest problems lie. We're raising food for cattle at, at a deficit to human beings, to feeding human beings. It takes, the, the figures vary, but it takes between, between six and eight pounds of vegetable protein to produce one pound of meat. And it takes thousands of gallons of water to produce one pound of meat. And so this whole mess that gets created there, uh, just on the, on the growth of the animals, the animal agriculture itself is enormous. But then you have other things, you have other factors, like I mentioned refrigeration when we were talking earlier. Refrigeration is one of the biggest polluters of air right? because of the gases that are used in the refrigerants. And what do we need to, what's the food that we need to refrigerate? No, it's mostly dairy food and meat. So we have refrigeration, we have transportation. Every time somebody buys, if, if you go into the supermarket and you look at the label on your vegetables even, and you say, where do these vegetables come from? I, 
I live in, in southern England, and the vegetables here come from New Zealand, they come from South America, they come from all over the world. Hardly any of them come from here in England. I have to go to a specialist store to get food that's actually grown here. So there's a, there's a book that came out recently called Drawdown, which is one of the most comprehensive overviews of what's happening in the world right now in terms of uh, climate change. And it, what they've done in Drawdown is very interesting. They've approached the problem not from how can we slow down things, but how can we actually reverse climate change? Not just slow it down, but reverse it. Are there things that don't require any new technologies, things that are available right now, that if we decided to do them, we could reverse this problem? And they come up with 100 ideas, and some of them are really foolishly simple. Right? Of the top 20 ideas, 10 of those have to do with food. Wow. Amazing. Ten, ten, 10 out of the top 20. Right? Amazing. And what we're going to put, we're going to put a reference to that book up on the screen here. Again, we're going to go over today on this interview because this is fascinating, important information. Let, let's go one more place is that this idea of cognitive dissonance, two competing opposite ideas in your head at the same time millions, hundreds of millions of animal lovers here in the United States, they own pets and dogs. And what, what, they, what they realize is, is that what, what they do is, is the, these dogs, uh, actually pigs are smarter or as smart as dogs. All mammals um, have um, young who need to be nurtured, they need to be played with. And really, um, there's, I've heard a lot of resources now that these animals actually suffer, that the, the, this whole industry. So at, at every angle you look at, let's talk a little bit about that. And then what I want to do is, is I want to get into what is a good diet? You know, you, you had this life transformation with the, uh, the ulcers. How can, wh what is the context of a good diet? So let's talk about the animal industry from that perspective for just a minute, and then we'll move on to what a good diet is. Well, there's a lot of reasons why people have stopped eating or, or have cut down or reduced their consumption of animal food. The first one, the most popular one, has to do with health. You know, particularly it's men of our age uh, who go to an enlightened cardiologist who says, I'll tell you how you can cure this problem, and it's not by having your chest cut open, it's by changing what you eat. Because now there's so much, there's so much research that's available now. There's the undeniable the things that were being said the last 20 years, and that is that you can reverse most heart disease. You know, some you can't. Some you have to have the surgery. You know, if you have to take uh, medicines, but that's a very, a very small portion. Right? Most people can change it just by changing, changing their diet. And so that's one reason why people change. Another is environmental reasons. A lot of younger people are starting to realize, hey, the things that I do every day in my life have a huge impact in the world. And so one of the things I do every day in my life is eat. If I can change what I eat, I'm going to impact the environment. I'm going to impact this huge social issue. And, and the third reason has to do with animal sentience. And that has to do with the fact that animals, uh, avoid pain, they want to be alive, they can, they can experience pleasure, they love their young, they try to nurture their young, most of them do. Uh, you know, so there are all these qualities which define sentience. And sentience means that they're conscious of, of what they're doing in the world. And without getting into the more horrific aspects of it, most people have never been to an abattoir. Most people have never seen an animal killed. Um, most people have never heard what a cow does when they take their calf away right after the calf is born because they're a milk animal. Uh, Marlene and I lived out in the country in, in, in Scotland, and when they took the calves away, it was horrific for a week no because you, all you could hear was this bellowing of these cows wanting their children back. No, and if you say the, if you use the word children, some people go, oh, they're not children, they're calves. No, they're children. They're children to that cow. No, so we, it's very difficult for us to make that leap because we have this embedded in our mind that it will do harm to us, that it's natural for us to do that. But we forget that people were saying it was natural to have slaves uh, not that long ago. 
people were saying that it was not natural for women to vote not that many decades ago. There are lots of things that weren't considered to be natural that we found out, well, that's just wrong, right? We yeah. were just being stupid, right? You know, I mean, we need to relook the, the issue. And the food that we eat is one of them, and our attitude toward animals is another one. And, and we have this species thing as well, you know. Uh, here in England last year, I think it was last year, a year before, last year I think it was, uh, there was this big scandal. They discovered that the hamburgers that were being sold by some of the major um, supermarket chains had horse meat in them. Hmm. Now the horse meat came from Poland. And so people don't know the food industry, but the food industry was buying meat from Poland and shipping it to Ireland and mixing it with beef, big slurry and making hamburger out of it. And when they found out there was horse meat in it, they went crazy because the British love horses, right? They love to see them racing. They love to have them in the paddock. They love horses. Uh, so they don't eat them. The French, however, will eat horse meat and consider it very tasty indeed. We right. get very excited when the Koreans eat dogs because, oh my God, it's a dog, right? And they're eating it. But like you said, a, a dog is a sentient animal when we know and we love them. But there are other animals that are sentient animals too. And we make that, that split, that cognitive right. split. Right. Um, and so we re this is another issue. You should, we just need to think about it. Well, if we can bring so, it up and start thinking about it. So true. Yeah, so true. And this, this idea of cognitive dissonance, which is those two diametrically opposed ideas at the same time. So to wrap that up, what we're looking at with the food, especially the animal food industry, is it's horrible for the environment, horrible for our health, and with and I, I'm I, I'm fascinated. I'm my background is not neuroscience, but I, I am a physician. Um, but I have a fascination with neuroscience. New neuroscience research is proving that all mammals are sentient. All mammals suffer. All mammals, mammals, all, most mammals, their young is born um, incapable of survival without them. And it's all, it's bred, it's actually into the, even the human brain, you know, how much, you know, baby, especially humans, because they are totally incapable of survival yeah. without their mother and father, et cetera. Fascinating, important. We could spend that on that topic all day. One, and, and, if this is too big of a topic to tackle now, because I really want to talk about what good health is, there is a trend in the United States now, and I don't know if it's hit the uh, Great Britain, is this keto diet. Um, can, can you comment on that briefly, or is that that's too much to unpack for right now? Oh, it's, not <laughs> it's not too much for me to unpack. I think it's crazy. <laughs> say, say you think it's crazy? Because what, you, what you're doing, what you're doing is you're putting your body into an incredible stress, ketosis, uh, which is, um, which in its extreme can lead to death. And of course, you start burning up a lot of fat and you start excreting. You no, know? so it's it's a real extreme way of losing weight. You will lose weight from it, but you're harming your kidneys, you're harming the rest, you're harming your liver when you do that. So to to produce consciously produce an illness so that you can look good because that's what it's all about. Let's face it. <laughs> it's about looking good. You know, I consciously put my health into in, in jeopardy in order to look good, but you can't sustain it. You can't sustain a diet like that. Right. It's craziness. You know, yeah. I mean, the, a good, a good diet is very, again, it's not a mystery, Steve. A good diet is not a mystery. Right. Again, if you go back to if you go back to the World Health Organization, the National Institutes of Health, all of those organizations, if you pick through the information, because they're very careful about how they say what they say, but if you boil it all down, it comes down to this: you need to eat a diet with lots and lots of fresh vegetables in it. You need to eat a diet that has good quality carbohydrate in it. And for me, that means whole grains. You have to have whole grains in there. You have to have carbohydrate-rich vegetables like squash and pumpkin, things like that. You have to have uh, colorful vegetables because that's where you get your antioxidants from. 
you don't need to go to the store and buy them. You just look for the color in your vegetables and you get lots of, you know, greens and yellows and different colored vegetables and make sure that you're eating those on a regular basis. You usually have to have beans too, because that's a good protein source together with the whole grain. And then you need nuts and seeds and fruit and, you know, herbs and other simple diet. It's, it's a third world diet for goodness sakes. And then the question comes, well, does it, is it tasty? Yes, you have to learn how to cook. You have to get back in the kitchen and learn how to cook. And, and, and not anything elaborate, just simple. Because if you don't do that, then what happens is you start looking for stuff that's already prepared in the marketplace. And for sure, they're going to mess with that. You know, um, you know, Whole Foods Market is a good example. Uh, maybe, maybe you don't want to have this part. You can edit this part out if you want. Whole, good, Whole, Whole Foods Market is a good example because um, when I was in the in natural foods business in the 1960s, a lot of little mom and pop shops started selling food. They started selling simple food. And some of them became very successful, like the organization that I worked with, Air One, and and Whole Foods and Mother Gooch and some that have fallen by the wayside or bought over by Whole Foods. And Whole Foods market was a very progressive market. But in order to capture a bigger and bigger audience, what it did was it started mimicking Safeway and Winn-Dixie and all of those. And the supermarket, all of a sudden, it became a supermarket, like a boutique supermarket. It had potato chips, but they were organic potato chips. <laughs> <laughs> fried, fried in coconut oil, you know, and they had, they had sun-dried tomatoes, but they are from a quaint village in Italy, you know, so it became a very kind of trendy upmarket thing, but people were turned on to the natural foods, and they started buying more and more, and now Jeff Bezos buys it, you know, so Amazon, Amazon now owns it. One of the first things he does when he comes in, he says, forget about the GMO issue, right? That's all settled. We're not going to mark anything, whether it's got GMOs, whether it doesn't have GMOs in it. Because that's what happens when you get too big. You get too big for your own britches. And one of the best ways that people can do to counteract that is by buying the food as food. Just buy the food, right? And then prepare it. Learn how to prepare it. It's not a big deal. You right. don't have to be a top chef. Right. Yeah. If you want to, but you don't have to be. You know, uh, just wrapping up the whole ketosis, ketoacidosis. I actually worked in the city with people from the Atkins Clinic and it did have benefits. It actually has some a very mo few health benefits, but the overall just is devastating to your body. And it's, yeah. it's becoming more and more popular. So simple. The, the other thing that people tend to, uh, when they're moving towards this keto, they tend to attack, uh, attack and you talked about it, simple carbohydrates. Just mention the, 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 uh, the problems with simple carbohydrates because you, you obviously advocate complex carbohydrates. Well, it, uh, we always have a language problem, and, and, and this is, uh, goes across the board in nutrition. Um, there is what's called starch, and, and people don't like that word, right, because that word is like, they don't want to talk about starch. But we have different ways that carbohydrate gets delivered, and when it gets delivered in its very simple form, it's starch. So if you, like potatoes are very starchy. They don't have a lot of nutrient load in terms of minerals and vitamins in them, but you know, they have a lot, of, a lot of complete starch. When you get to grains, grains have a really good balance of not only not only carbohydrate but also protein and also buffering agents and so if you were going to live on one food and be really healthy you'd probably have to have to get a whole grain like either brown rice or or, or millet or quinoa something like that you know to to have it and people get confused with this because a lot of uh, authors will write and they'll write about carbohydrate but what they're talking about is refined flour or refined uh, bread and that's not food. That's non-food. So we've taken all the nutrients out of it, except the carbohydrate. And then maybe you've added a few more in just to make it look nutritious. Um, right. I, there was a guy, I don't, you might remember him from the health industry. Um, there was a guy named uh, Paul Bragg, who was a, a real early outlier in the health industry in 1940s and 1950s Paul Bragg was like very muscly guy and he was part of this group that 
were in Southern California and they were the muscle men, you know, Gypsy Boots and Paul Bragg and all these guys. And, and, and they were kind of screwball guys, but they had a lot of, a lot of good, good things to say. And uh, he used to do this demo in, in his, when he gave lectures and he was a very dynamic, funny speaker. And he would take a, uh, several slices of bread and he would crush them together and he would crush it up like a ball. And then he would bounce it on the floor. <laughs> and he would say, do you want to be eating this? <laughs> you know, I, I was listening I was listening to uh, Marlene, and she was saying, if you eat bread, you're dead. If you I, Something to that effect. And she was talking about the low nutritional value. Oh, wow. We could go on for hours here, but we have to bring this in. So you have... We, we have talked about a real a, a number of issues. Bill, I'm going to right now invite you back to do another interview. Do you? I, I'm putting you on the spot. Will you do that for us? Oh, sure. Okay, good, because this is really amazing. I love, I love to talk. That's what I do. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is really amazing information. You and your wife, Marlene. Mar, Marlene is uh, one of our – we just love Marlene here. She's been so helpful, communicative. Uh, her energy is overwhelmingly positive. It really is amazing. And the two of you together really offer tremendous value, especially in this health ecology market. Before we, before we end this, is there anything else you want to say? I mean, I'm, I'm going to have you back. Is there anything else you want to say? Anything we left out? Anything that's really important right now to discuss? No, I think the main, one of the main messages that we have is that this is not difficult. This is not brain surgery. You know, uh, there's two important things about diet, very important. One is what you stop eating, and the other is what you start eating. You know, and what you start eating, you're probably eating already. You know, most people eat vegetables, and they, they have grain in one form or another, and they might have beans now and again, you know, and you know, they have fruit and nuts and seeds. So that's a, focus on that. And leave out the animal products, the sugar, the artificial foods. If, even if you just took those out and ate cardboard, you'd probably feel better. <laughs> oh, really? I mean, we consume a lot of junk that we don't need. Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And how, let's, let's, let's uh, get this uh, verbally. We're also going to embed it in the video. How can they get in touch with you? How can they tap into your resources? Obviously, we have a lot of it on RDT. How can they get in touch with you? Well, the, the best way is through our website, which is macrovegan, M-A-C-R-O-V-E-G-A-N, dot org, right? And macrovegan dot org. We're still, like as you are, we're still building that site because we've closed down our individual sites. And for, so we're tr trying to transfer information into that new site and, uh, and, and, and get it so that it works. And I'm, sh I'm sure you can sympathize with this, but sometimes the biggest headache in the world is getting a website that actually works. Yeah. <laughs> that people can navigate you know, and find what they're looking for. So we keep building on it every, literally every week. You know, and, uh, there's already resources of recipes in there. There's, uh, there, there's, there's, there's information, essays, and, and videos, and all sorts of things. And those connect into YouTube. And so, yeah, we do the best we can to try to, 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 try to get the information out there. Yeah, no, you're doing a great job. And we have a lot of resources on our site. We link back to you, et cetera. Bill, this has been phenomenal. As I said, I'm putting you on the spot. We're going to have you back in the near future. Um, and we're going we're gonna to close it down now. My name is Dr. Stephen Cangiano, uh, president and co-founder of RD&T Media and Events. Thank you for joining us. Bill, thanks again. It's been phenomenal. Thank you, Steve. It's wonderful to see you again. Very good. Take care.